Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. We're bringing you another episode of our Windows security series. Tonight, we're going to be talking about Windows Defender Application Guard, or has it's been renamed as Microsoft Defender Application Guard. So what is it? So to start off, it is something that controls an application uh, to see if it can be executed or not executed on Windows 10 and also Windows 11 devices. MDAC, which I'll call for short as Microsoft Defender Application Control, it'll prevent the execution, running, and loading of unwanted or malicious code, drivers, and scripts. It doesn't trust any software that it doesn't know about, and it will guarantee that only trusted code through a feature called Configurable Code Integrity can run or execute after the bootloader, uh, after uh, from the bootloader onwards. So it makes sure that only code is trusted before any OS code can run. There's a lot of really good use cases for this. For example, if you have a call center and you have a bunch of workers who are on standardized desktops that have the same software running and you know that pretty much they're in this software every day and maybe they use the browser to browse YouTube and and whatnot after that. You know that they're not going and installing different programs for their job because they don't need it or maybe a kiosk situation. I had a company that I worked for that actually had PCs inside of a checkout which was in public adam have you ever seen those city bikes that are um on the corners yep. of, of different cities yep we have them here yeah so inside of those are generally a pc and you know that it runs one piece of software right, right. so you don't need to install different things so if that machine ever got compromised and they try to install something on there Something like this, Windows Defender Application Control, would be able to prevent that code from running. What's important about this feature, as anyone who has ever deployed any type of app whitelisting or application control program, you'll know that it takes some feeding and care. It is not something that you just set and forget, unless it's like a kiosk where you know that it's just the one thing. But if you deploy it to many different types of organizations uh, or um, departments within your organization, you're going to need to update like an allow list. The nice thing about this is that it runs on any version of Windows 10 that is supported today. You want to, um, it'll also run on uh, Windows 11. So, A lot of people confuse it with AppLocker. That's actually been out for a while. And Microsoft recommends using MDAC instead of AppLocker. And I think it's because there's some continuous features, update, and support. But AppLocker still works. It's not getting any feature updates. Um, It's still good. And I think one of the differences is that it's missing the ability to block drivers as well as the biggest difference is app locker policies can be targeted to users and groups, whereas MDAC policies can be targeted to devices. I'll pause there and see, Adam, do you have any thoughts on all of that? I believe app locker debuted with windows seven and like a lot of technology from that era, it was good for its time. And you highlighted already some of the differences with Defender application control as far as tying into that hardware um, root of trust almost. 
and ensuring that you have code integrity across the entire boot chain, essentially. So once the system has begun booting up and from there forward, you can validate that it is cryptographically you know, intact, essentially, and that the only things that are running are things that should be running. And what this really does, if you think about it, this gets you much closer to the operational model of a smartphone like iOS or Android who were just whose operating systems were designed from the get-go to only run signed code and they have cryptographically trusted you know root security all the way through the boot chain as well so it's similar in that sense and I, I'd be willing to bet under the covers there's some technology shared here with like Xbox as an example which also only runs signed code as well so this really can deliver a much stronger security posture but I like that you called out like some use cases to use this in because I think many years ago, and I think when carbon black became the sexy new thing on the market, everyone thought we're going to do application whitelisting and lock down our workstations and it's going to be great. And I know of uh, one of my former employers, in fact, had a carbon black installation go horribly wrong and locked out like the whole environment and um, was essentially everyone was dead in the water for a day or two or three. I, I don't know all the details other than it was bad. And um, I think for like, you know, arbitrary end user endpoints where they can and are used to running um, a lot of different applications, this might not make sense for that. But there are plenty of use cases where it can. And as we always talk about on this show, just because you can't use the tool in every use case doesn't mean you can't close off some of that attack surface. And that's what I think of this is, you have attack surface on some of your endpoints and you can dramatically reduce it with this tool. So I'm curious to learn more myself on, on how we get this deployed and use it. Um, and, and definitely can think of use cases, scenarios I can recommend to customers where if you haven't looked at application control, you really should. Yeah, so a common misconception is that application control is a replacement of AppLocker. And that's not exactly the case, right? App Locker controls the execution of application and files, but it doesn't include that trusted chain of code from boot to OS. And so MDAC offers that chain of trust, right? From when the, the device boots up to the kernel, and it's not really a replacement of App Locker. And in some cases, AppLocker actually works better as far as controlling the applications themselves. And you can actually deploy AppLocker with MDAC. You can, you can use both of them at the same time. So you can use MDAC first and then combine it with AppLocker to fine tune it if you so choose. But you could also just use the modern version uh, and um, just use the modern version of MDAC on its own and it's also very good just know that one of the nice things about this i i think it's nice but maybe your admins may not any policies that you have within mdac also will block an admin from that application so it's a good way of kind of limiting what your admins can execute on the advice if you so choose which is also good security if a an attacker gets admin credentials and tries to execute something windac is something that can defend against that so let's talk about how you can deploy it and test it there's four different ways that you can deploy defender application control you can use Intune using the built-in policy or a custom OMA URI. You can do it through Microsoft Endpoint Configuration Manager. You can deploy through GPO or you can deploy through PowerShell. I'm not going to talk through a bunch of the GPO and PowerShell methods, but a lot of what we talk about are, is applicable to those methods. Mainly just going to talk through 
the Intune versions of it because I actually have experience deploying this uh, with the built-in policy, which I'll tell you kind of the pros and cons of that, and then the custom OMA URI, which I actually learned something as part of this blog that we'll link in the show notes that we kind of built the show uh, on tonight. So the built-in policy, it's very, very simple within Intune. There is a configuration profile or the endpoint protection profile that you can configure, and it is one setting. Turn it on, and if you turn it on, there's two configuration settings. One is called application code control code integrity policy, and that's basically a turn it on or turn it off. Same thing, there's another setting called trust apps with good reputation, which uses the Microsoft Intelligence Security Graph, and you can either turn it on or turn it off. And so the the pros of this is that it's super easy to implement. If you have a kiosk and you really don't care about having uh, an allow list and you just want to make sure that uh, the code integrity is enforced and you're trusting apps with good reputation, you can deploy it through Intune with the built-in template and it's pretty much good to go from there. But there's not a whole lot of options for customization. There's not a whole lot of options for anything else. So outside of that, we'll talk about this custom CSP where you can actually customize it with a tool. But before we get there, Adam, can you tell our listeners what in the world is the Microsoft Intelligence Security Graph? Absolutely. So the Microsoft Intelligence Security Graph is a thing. It is a tangible, real thing, but was also something that was used in Microsoft security marketing, especially in, I'd say, like the 2017 to 2019 timeframe. Lately, we talk about it a little less than we used to. But the idea is you have a data lake and you feed into this data lake threat intelligence from all of the different sources and services that Microsoft operates. And Microsoft has a very unique view of the threat landscape because Microsoft's one of the only really security vendors that has both a consumer and enterprise play all in one. And so across those 200 plus cloud and consumer services, they're all collecting different telemetry or signal um, as appropriate. So Microsoft runs an identity platform, Azure Active Directory, and captures a tremendous amount of telemetry from the many, many, many sign-ins, um, billions of sign-ins that Microsoft processes every single day, you know, as an example. Microsoft issues Windows updates to billions of Windows PCs and can learn from them. The Microsoft Defender antivirus and anti- anti-malware suite runs on, you know, millions of devices and they report in reputation of the executables that they run, whether they do bad things or not. And so all of these feed into that data lake and it can be used to determine reputation on things like URLs or in this case, executables. And then that can be queried and a result can be returned back very, very quickly. And so that's what we're talking about here, where if we try to run something, go check in with the intelligence security graph has another windows endpoint somewhere in the world, tried to run this executable and determine this thing is actually really bad. And that can happen in, in very short periods of time, I know this is several years ago now, but in one of Microsoft's earning calls, Satya Nadella actually walked through like a, an example, a real world one, where a new zero day malware was installed and executed at a small business, like somewhere in Tennessee here in the United States. And it was very quickly, like within seconds or milliseconds caught and blocked on billions of Windows PCs around the world. And that's an example where you had a, you know, a very targeted, almost spear phishing like attack of to, to try to hit this small business, assuming they have, you know, weaker security, but because of Microsoft Defender working together with all of that cloud telemetry and cloud backed intelligence, it was able to block it at first sight and then tell everything else around the world never to run this. 
And so that's a perfect example of if that would try to execute and you have this setting turned on, it's going to check in. Hey, what's the reputation of this? The reputation is crap. Don't run it. Um, and, and that's something you just get, you know, with, with flipping the switch here, which is pretty cool. So that's kind of the intelligence security graph and how it would map in this case to reputation for executables. Thanks for that. So I learned something reading through this blog article because I didn't know that Microsoft had a wizard tool specifically for application control. It's called the WinDAC wizard. And so we'll put a link in the show notes for that. It is also in the blog that we're going to link. But when you go and get this tool and run it, what it does is it runs you through a wizard to build a policy for Windows application control. Now, the, the first screen, you can actually build a single policy or you can build a multiple policy format. And this is also something I didn't realize, but you can build a template or base policy and then let's say you have updates to that policy. Well, you can then add a supplemental policy. And Windows 10, 1903 and up actually supports up to 32 active policies on a single device. So no need to worry about having to update your base policy or a single policy and push it out each time. You can keep that policy in place and then add a supplemental policy on top of that without having to change the base policy that's already there. There are three different options. You can do it in default Windows mode, allow Microsoft mode, or signed and reputation mode. And as that goes down the chain, it gets a little bit more and more relaxed on what you're going to allow. But in the default Windows mode, it is just the fresh Windows install apps that are installed from the Microsoft Store or Office 365, um, Office 365 apps, uh, or the third-party Windows hardware compatible drivers that are deployed through Windows Update. One second, Adam. Sorry about that. In the Allow Microsoft mode... It's everything above that, but you also include any software that's signed by Microsoft. And then finally, in the signed and uh, reputable, reputable mode, it is all of the above that we talked about, as well as files with a good reputation with the intelligence security graph. So you pick one of these modes, and for the most part, I think if I was to deploy this in an org, I would go with the signed and reputable mode unless I really, really just wanted to lock it down to the Microsoft Office apps and stuff from the Microsoft Store. Of course, you can always add and allow rule in that if you want to do that too. But the the default mode is, is pretty restrictive. So there are a lot of different policies within the templates after you pick that. And I'll just call out a couple. The ISG option is one of them. You can also deploy this in audit mode. And so that's really good for testing because you can then monitor the blocked events and then edit rules um, to allow or deny and then try it again, right? So edit your XML, your rules, deploy it again, and then see um, in audit mode if the events are still blocking. And there's also something called an unsigned system integrity policy. And if you disable that, you actually have to protect the MDAC policy by digitally signing the policy. So even if a local administrator tries to tamper with it, they won't be able to because it's digitally signed. So that's a, another way to kind of protect it because you're actually protecting the policy from ever getting tampered with. So after you do that, you review the XML, you have to convert it to a .bin file, which you can do within the tool, or you can do it through PowerShell with an XML file. And then you go to Intune and deploy the OMA URI policy. After you deploy it, there's a bunch of different ways to monitor it. You can look in MS Info under System to see if it's there. It creates a policy within the System32 folder under Code Integrity. So if a policy shows up there, you'll know that the machine got your policy. You can also monitor the event logs for certain IDs, 3090, 
3092. And of course you can, there's a PowerShell query, right? There's a PowerShell query for everything to see if it's running. And so there is one here as well. So one of the things in the article also talks about as you're thinking about your deployment, how you want to essentially capture all the things that you want to do before you build your policy. And you can do, you know, back in the day they had the golden image, right? So you can spin up the machine that you want to capture with all the processes. There's of course another PowerShell script that you can run to capture all the different publishers that are running on that machine. And then you can upload it to the tool and the tool will build the list for you, which is really nice. And then as you're testing, you can edit that XML file within the tool. If you need to add or deny a certain policy, a uh, certain program, and then re export the XML in a bin file. So I think this tool is probably one of the biggest discoveries. I know that for myself, I'm going to test it within my lab and deploy windows defender application guard because I deployed it as the built in template. And I think it was really, really difficult mainly because it pretty much locked everything down for me. Um, even though it's based on the ISG, simple applications like notepad plus plus and seven zip were blocked. And so I'm going to test it using this tool, build in my allow list and then test it again. So I think if you're interested in locking this down, um, that was the one single thing that I took away that will make this deployment a lot easier. Any thoughts on that, Adam? All of the different deployment methodologies, it, it's interesting. You know, I can think of obviously very simple to deploy through modern management styles like Intune and Configuration Manager. But yeah, if you're still running that golden image and most organizations still are today, you know, get it fully built out there and then capture all of what you've got trusted in there and, and get that built. And that's pretty cool too, that, you know, you can both accomplish this through kind of more of a modern practice as well as what, what a lot of people are still doing today. So this tool really meets you where you are in your management journey as well. And, and this is something you can add to your arsenal. seems like in a pretty straightforward fashion and especially audit mode makes it really straightforward to test this and kind of figure out where you're at with your policies. If users would be really negatively impacted and then you can adjust and try again before you actually deploy it. So I love anything where you can measure twice and cut once essentially. And it sounds like this gives you a lot of options to do that. So uh, really appreciate you walking through all of the, all the details here, obviously the, the devil's in the details. And so listeners who want to move forward with this, of course, please do consult the documentation, but Andy's giving you a really nice roadmap of what is possible and even what, what might have eluded you at first glance because capturing some of these things like the the tool to help build those files as well as some of the different deployment methodologies sometimes those are uh sometimes those are hard to discover so this this has been a really great conversation i I love what we're going over here yeah and when you're testing this out obviously there's the audit mode and as well as you can always target different policies to specific devices, right? And so in Intune, of course, you can scope your policy to a specific set of devices. If you're deploying it through GPO, it can be applied to a test OU. Importantly, it's also uh, to note that if you're trying to remove Defender Application Control, you're going to want to unassign the policy from the device before you delete the policy, there is a sometimes practice, which I think actually is argue, uh, argued among some of the folks within Microsoft. But I talked to a support guy once, and he, of course, deals with this all the time. And he swore to me that uh, policies sometimes get tattooed onto a device. And so they actually mentioned that in this article, where if you delete the Intune policy, the 
the fender application control policy may stay there and actually never get removed. So the best way if you're actually trying to remove it from a device is to unassign the device, check the folder, which we mentioned, to see if there's still a policy file in there. And if it's empty, then you're good to go. Or they also mentioned that you can deploy like an allow all XML, which you can scope that and just allow all and deploy that to the device to kind of overwrite your old policy. But just make sure that you're not just deleting the policy and hoping everything is okay because that policy file within that folder may still stay. And if it is, it's still being enforced. So any final thoughts, Adam? Just on the last one, you know, it's interesting to think about there is, I guess, don't let that deter you because I, I doubt that's a common use case where you'd want to completely rip that back out, but it's good to know some of that behavior. I think we, we view that sometimes through the lens of like with mobile devices where putting management on and ripping management off, we expect that to fully go on and off. And in fact, that's a common use case where I've left one company and go to another company and I need to take one management plane off and put a new one on, and that needs to be full and complete. But generally, Windows PCs aren't like moving from being fully managed to not all of a sudden. And so, and, and when they are, they're getting flattened and reinstalled anyway. But still good to know, right? If you do had been testing this and say your, you know, your PC at, at, at work and you want to back it out, uh, good to know that you really should deploy kind of an empty. Um, or, or just an allow list first, a, a allow all, I should say, uh, before you proceed. So this is just, this has been really cool to walk through. And, you know, what I was thinking out loud or thinking quietly about as we were talking through this is we have done several shows now on some of the different security components inside of Windows. We've talked about Windows Hello for Business in the past. We've talked about uh, Windows Defender Credential Guard in the past and how that protects credentials against things like pass the hash. And so I think one thing I'll do with this show and, and those past shows is I'm going to like build a playlist on, on our YouTube channel where they're all in one place and you can kind of get, get the feel of, of go through all of the different windows security technologies in one spot. And um, I think there's still, we have more to cover, right, Andy, but it's been fun going through these different guards and controls and, learning all of these techniques that are in there and just a, a lot of people aren't using. I talk to so many different customers and I say like, well, you're using credential guard, right? And I get the, uh, what's credential guard? Well, you own it and you should really deploy it. Cause there's not a whole heck of a lot of downside to it unless you have like a weird Wi-Fi network. Um, and, and this is another one of those again, not right for every use case, but for the use cases it is for kiosk PCs, for single application PCs, Get this one done. This is a huge reduction in attack surface. And I'm not going to say it's like the easiest, you know, one and done deployment, but this has a lot of benefits, I think, that can outweigh, you know, the time investment it's going to take to get deployed. Final word, you mentioned you own this. This actually is included in Windows Enterprise only. It is not a feature of Windows 10 Pro or Windows 10 Home. But again, if you're a Windows 10 Enterprise, Windows 11 Enterprise customer, you own this. And so don't go out and buy like Carbon Black or something like that, their application control um, app, which basically does this same thing, which is built into Windows, which you can do fairly easily. If you just want to deploy through Intune, I mean, it's trivial, trivial to deploy. Um, but if you want to customize it a little bit, yeah, you can take some time and do this tool and, and download that. So um, good cost takeout or cost savings if you know, you're know you thinking about it. So that is our show for this week. Hopefully you learned something about Windows Defender Application Control or Microsoft Defender Application Control. Thanks uh, for listening and watching as always. Our contact information will be in the show notes if you guys have any questions or topics you want us to talk about. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.